It was about five years ago on an Easter Sunday, packed congregation, we were belting out, Christ the Lord is risen today. And as was tradition in our church down in Longview, the ushers on the third hymn would go around and collect prayer cards of uh, requests that people had. And I was on for praying for, for people that day. We're about halfway through the song, and this large stack of prayer cards was handed to, to me. And I started reading through them with Christ the Lord is risen today in the backdrop. And I soon experienced this odd dissonance in my heart. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. And then I'm reading, please pray for our 18-month-old with cystic fibrosis who is struggling to breathe. Raise our joys and triumphs high. Hallelujah. Pray for my husband who is depressed and dealing with drug addiction. Where, O death, is now your sting? Hallelujah. Please pray for the Pearson family whose two-year-old died in a tragic accident this week. It was that one that kind of broke me. I had to kind of revisit later and do some journaling through. But there was this dissonance between the hope of Easter and the reality of pain and brokenness in our world. And I'm wondering if some of us today are maybe coming in that place today where we're experiencing a bit of dissonance between these beautiful hymns that we have sung and some of the reality of the pain and the hurt that we come here with today. I think of our friends online today who are experiencing a very different Easter where we're not surrounded by large groups. There's not kids running outside collecting eggs, but there's some isolation. I think of those who perhaps are, are just coming with family today, but as you hear some of these claims of Christianity, you're a little bit skeptical, maybe hardened towards, towards, towards the church, wondering if this really is, is true. And, and I think of some of you today, and I've had the privilege over the last few months of getting to know some of your stories, and I know that a lot of us have suffered this year. It's been a year of struggle as we've navigated this pandemic. We've had some hard stories of loss, some hard stories of, of heartbreak. And so it can feel a little bit dissonant when we sing about this joy. And, and I don't know about you, but sometimes when you're in that space, we can feel as if Easter Sunday doesn't really belong to me. We feel a little bit on the fringe of that. We're hesitant to hope, holding it at an arm's length. I have a dear friend down in Longview who hasn't been able to go to Easter Sunday services for a few years since her husband died. It just felt too much, too much. But friends, I want us to notice that the first Easter happened in precisely that kind of space. It did not happen in a packed out sanctuary with a brass section. It didn't happen around a table with a good meal and a family. No, it happened in a graveyard next to a weeping woman named Mary. That was where the first Easter began. And so what I want to do today is I want to reclaim Easter for those of you today who are poor in spirit, for those of you today who come mourning because God says you are blessed. And I believe that this day belongs to you. Because what we discover in this story is that precisely in the various graveyards of life, in those places of heartbreak, that is where God shows up. And what I want to discover is how this weeping woman who, whose ears are so clouded with grief that she can't even see signs of God anymore, who has faced so much trauma that the, the hope of resurrection is overshadowed, how this woman, Mary Magdalene, at the end of this encounter, leaves with joy and renewed purpose. How does this happen for Mary, and how might it happen for us today, particularly those of us who come feeling poor in spirit? So I noticed some things in this story, how this turnaround, how this change happens in Mary's life. And the first thing I notice is that she stays at the tomb. It's notable that the other disciples run back. Uh, they leave prematurely, but she stays there. And she's still seeking and she's still looking for answers, even though it's so confusing and she's so full of grief. Notice her answer, they have taken my Lord. Do you hear the tinge of faith that remains there? Jesus is still her Lord. And I think this is instructive to us as we navigate those seasons where we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that we have this reflex, this desire to run or run away. Let's just avoid it, let's deny it, let's... Just pretend everything's okay. But Mary stays. 
And I think that by staying there, by continuing to look and explore, that she discovers some more hope. You see, the hope of Easter isn't the small band-aid on this gaping wound of human suffering, this quick fix, but it is something that actually helps us through the pain. And so can we take the risk of stepping into those hard questions, trusting that God might meet us in those places? She stays at the tomb. The second thing I notice is that she is given space, space to lament. Now, hear this question that she has posed. Woman, why are you crying? And again, Jesus asks this question. Woman, why are you crying? I want to suggest to you that this is not to be read as a rebuke, as if Jesus is saying, why are you crying? It's Easter Sunday. Be happy, right? That's not how I read this. I believe that this isn't a rebuke, but instead it is an invitation, Jesus does not rebuke people for crying. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I see in this question this beautiful space that Mary is given to name the grief that she is facing. And I want to suggest to you that that is a powerful gift that help, can help us navigate and move from grief to hope. It's to be given space to wrestle with this question, why are you crying? Doug uh, Manning is a counselor, and I use some of his material to train our pastoral care team down in Longview, and he has this great quote, and he says, <clears throat> says, I've been a counselor my whole life, and I still have no idea how it works. People come in, and they tell me their problems, and I grunt every once in a while, and they get better. They are healed. It's just this miracle, but it's this powerful reality that when we have those various wailing walls, those places where we can share why we are crying, what it is we are looking for, that healing can begin to happen. And I believe Jesus is affording Mary this space today. Woman, why, why are you crying? Can you tell me what is the deep pain that you are carrying with you? That, I believe, is part of the road towards healing. It's not around the grief. It's not over it. It is through it by having space to name why we are crying. And so, friends, I just want to extend this question to you today. I'm wondering why you might be crying today. Why you might be crying today. What pain, what grief you are holding today. Can we create some space to just name that? today. Maybe you might want to sit with that question this week. Why are you crying? My spiritual director always says, follow the tears, Phil, because that gives us deep insight into what's really going on below the surface. And it is through this, through having space by staying with this pain, that Mary, I believe, is now in a receptive posture. She is open now to discover an answer to that question. But the good news is that there is something to actually receive. Receptivity isn't helpful if there is nothing to receive. But we discover now that as she wrestles with this question, she turns towards Jesus, and she begins now to see a bigger story. You know, sometimes grief can cloud our vision and and it can be all that we can see. But as she encounters and has now this conversation with Jesus, we see that there is a bigger story that she's able to angle out a bit and see that there's something more than just this current grief, that there actually is some hope in our midst. And I want us to notice what she sees in this text. And the first thing that she discovers that she sees is that Jesus is present with her. Now, at first, she doesn't see it. She mistakes him for the gardener. Again, her eyes so clouded with tears that she can't see signs of God. And and it's this very ordinary image. And sometimes God is in the ordinary, this gardener, right? But she struggles to see him, but discovers that God is present with her even though she doesn't actually see it. But Jesus is right there in our midst, in her midst, I want to pull up this quote from Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and she she says this, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. I love this image about how if we have eyes to see, behind the ordinary are beautiful signs of God's presence in our midst. And I wonder if God wants us to see again the signs of beauty 
the signs of goodness, the signs of truth that are sometimes overlooked in our world. James Martin is a Jesuit priest, and he uh, works in New York City, and he was mentoring a group of actors off-Broadway, and they were doing a play about this Jesuit group. And so he was kind of telling them what Ignatian spirituality was all about. And one of the Ignatian prayers is the prayer of examine, where at the end of the day, you review the day, and you look back, and the first thing you do is say, God, help me see where you have been at work this day. Help me see those signs of goodness and truth and beauty. And so he's working with these secular actors. They're, they're not Christians, they're agnostics. But he invited them into this prayer practice every evening. And there is a group just naming all the signs of beauty. And this one actor came up to James Martin at the end of this practice, and he said, I never realized how beautiful my yesterdays were. I never realized how beautiful my yesterdays were when I actually took time to see behind the ordinary, behind the garden, behind the gardener, was a sign of God's presence in our midst. Perhaps that might be a beautiful Easter practice for you at the end of the day to look for those signs. You know, it's really significant that Jesus is mistaken for the gardener, I think. A lot of commentators point out that John 20 is like this new creation story, is redoing Genesis 1. John 20 begins on the first day of the week and it's dark. And there's this gardener, they're in a garden. At the end of John, Jesus breathes his spirit on them, just as God first breathed life into Adam. And what's happening here, I think, is that Jesus is now sowing and cultivating new creation. He is undoing Adam's work. He is this true gardener. So we are invited to see where are those signs of new life sprouting up in the midst of our world she sees God's presence. She also sees and discovers a new identity for herself. A new identity for herself. Notice that what really awakens her eyes is when Jesus calls her by name, Mary. Mary. And there's all kinds of beautiful language in John 20 that reminds us that our true identity is as people who are children of God. When Jesus commissions Mary, he tells her to go to his brothers. He says, tell them, I'm going to my father and your father. Do you hear the relational language? And what Jesus is saying to Mary is that your true identity is that you are a child of God. Mary, he calls her by name. She is known. You are a child of God. What a beautiful word that cuts through our despair and discouragement. But that's our true identity you know, Mary Magdalene, I imagine, has a bit of a, a struggle around identity. We learned back in Luke 8 that she was first introduced into the gospel story as someone who was possessed by demons. And in that day and age, people that had those types of experience were really looked down upon as people that, and maybe in our context, uh, people that are having like convulsions and visions and someone that's maybe not seen very trustworthy and in this day and age, she's also a woman, and women in this culture were often looked down upon. And through all that noise, through perhaps the bullies that have mislabeled her, a culture has said she is less than, this word Mary cuts through. And she hears again her true identity. Can we hear the good news in that today? The good news in that today. Thomas Long tells a story uh, about a lady named Marianne Bird. It's a true story, and she wrote about it in a memoir later in her life. But uh, Mary Ann Bird grew up with some disabilities, a cleft palate, and uh, talks about how she was experiencing a lot of bullying in school. And she had this wonderful teacher named Miss Leonard who turned out to be a real turning point person in her life. One day during school, they, they were doing this whole homespun hearing test, and, and Miss Leonard had the kids come forward. And she'd whisper something into their ear, and they would have to respond just so they could test their hearing. And Marianne walked down, her head hanging low, discouraged, and Miss Leonard whispered into her ear, Mary, I wish you were my little girl. I wish you were my little girl. What a... Beautiful thing. And Mary Ann Bird, when she writes, she became a teacher herself, but wrote about how that was this turning point moment 
that broke her free from a world that was saying she was less than, that she was a broken person. And friends, what I want you to hear today is that there is a God who calls out to you, calls your name, and he doesn't just say, I want, wish you were my child. He says, you are my child. In John 1, it says that when we call upon God, we are given the right to be called sons and daughters of God. May that meet you as good news today as well. There's a God who gives us a new identity on Easter Sunday. So she sees signs of God's presence. She discovers a new identity. And then finally, she discovers a new purpose, a new mission for her life. Now we'll know it at the end of the story that Mary is clinging to Jesus And he says, Mary, you have to let me go. He doesn't say, don't touch me. Some translations get it wrong. It's not that we can't approach Jesus and hug him. But he's saying, there are other people that I want you to reach out to. And there is more work to do. do." You see, the Christian journey isn't just Jesus and me. It is Jesus and mission. And so Mary is now commissioned to go out into a world overcome by grief overcome by pain, to now express this good news towards others. She is commissioned and given a new calling. And perhaps for some of us today, there is just this rediscovery that we have a mission that we are on. There are other people who are filled with tears that God wants to send us to, to be that wailing wall for other people, right? People that we can walk with and care for. We are given a mission. It's not just Jesus and me. It's Jesus and mission. And I love that Mary, again, is the one that is commissioned. Again, a woman uh, whose testimony in the ancient world would be looked down upon, someone with a past and a history, is the person that God chooses to send out as a messenger of good news into the world. One of the reasons why a lot of commentators say that if this was a myth that would be made up, they wouldn't have been making Mary Magdalene the hero of the story because women were not commissioned like this. Their testimony was looked down upon. But Jesus takes this unexpected person and makes her, as some people call it, the apostle to the apostles. This woman, Mary, is given a mission. And perhaps today there is an invitation for us to rediscover that we have work to do. We get to be part of a beautiful work of bringing good news to this world. And so, friends, we see that this woman who is weeping in a graveyard, as she turns towards Jesus, it says, verse 14, as she turns around towards Jesus, encounters this transformation. I want to read this Uh, excerpt from Dale Bruner, commenting on just this phrase, she turned around. In the one or two seconds this turn took, I imagine the world shifting ever so slightly on its axis. And at about this turn's one second midpoint trajectory, history too moved almost imperceptibly from BC to AD. A second before this turn, there is a woman in the deepest despair and the agonizing presence of inconquerable death. And a second after, the beginning of this turn, there is a woman in the deepest possible human elation in the presence of the death-conquering central figure of history. When she turned to him at this moment, human history took a turn to a responsible hope for the vincibility of death and so to the conquest of meaninglessness. She turned around and there saw Jesus. And I'm wondering today if this might be an opportunity, a moment for us to have a turning point, a turning point, to turn around and discover again the hope that Christ is with us and that he loves us and that he has good work for us to do. You know, for some of us, this year has been a a difficult year spiritually. We've been navigating social distancing, we've perhaps found ourselves drifting, struggling to focus. Maybe this Easter Sunday is an invitation to turn back to the Lord and so discover this life that is truly life. I want to extend that invitation to you to turn around. 
And I want to reach out to those of you who perhaps have, have never made a turn towards Christ, that perhaps you're just visiting with family or you're listening in the background at a family gathering and maybe are a little bit hesitant around this message. I just want to simply acknowledge you today and say that God sees you and invites you to turn and experience these gifts. That we can turn to him and, and we're not required to have our lives together to earn our way back into his graces. No, that is not the gospel message. It says in scripture that while we were still sinners, while we were still struggling, Christ died for us and he sees us in our grief and our questions and our brokenness, and he says, come and live. Come, turn towards me. So I invite you now to, to turn around today and discover Jesus in your midst. It says in Romans 10 that if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And perhaps you might want to call upon him today as your Lord and Savior. Friends, may we all, wherever we're at today, wherever hard story we bring with us today, know that there is a God bigger than the pain, the brokenness that we feel. There is a story that's bigger than the temporary struggles we experience. May we turn and see a God who is with us, a God who loves us, and a God who gives us a new purpose. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for this story of Easter. And we celebrate it in faith today, believing that the truths represented in your word point to a true reality beyond the words. And so, Lord, I pray that you would take these words and that they would be planted within our hearts, that you would set us free from the, the pain that we experience today. Help us see you, God, discover you again. Lord, I pray that your resurrection power would be experienced in our midst, we pray in your name. Amen.